I, I maintain a program called Scatter, which is written in uh, Java. And, um, you know, you could use it in Windows and Mac and Linux and stuff like that. Uh, so I have some slides here. I want to go over uh, the thing. It's kind of the background for um, uh, uh, the stuff that you can do in Scatter. Uh, and so, so when you manually process the data, you know, depending on the beamline that you're at, uh, most of the time you'll probably get subtracted data sets. But in some cases, you may need to subtract it yourself. Um, or, you know, if you're processing size exclusion chromatography data, uh, that, that it's, you know, the processing of that data is a subtraction process. So, um, so you know, just to kind of uh, make sure we're on the same page here, uh, this is kind of what we're going to cover really quickly. So what is the SAC signal? Just the basics of, of how we describe or talk about a curve. Uh, things that contribute to data quality, sample quality, and then, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you start processing your curve, you, you, you really want to know if, it's, if, it's, if this is good for structural modeling, what kind of information can I get out of it, or should I go back and, and uh, recollect data? Um, okay, so do you guys see a mouse? Do you guys see this mouse? Is there a mouse? Yes, we see. Okay. Um, so basically, this is a SACS curve, as Greg uh, was pointing out. A lot of times you see it on log, log 10 scale here on the y-axis. And then uh, on, on the x-axis here, it's just regular uh, linear scale. Uh, the near zero, we call this low, low resolution, lower resolution. And as you go to higher Q, uh, this would be higher resolution. Uh, Q is what we call a, a momentum transfer vector. Uh, you'll see it uh, in the literature as Q or S. Um, the units typically are in angstroms if you're in the UK and the US. Uh, in the EU, they tend to do nanometers, so you'll have to interconvert depending on the software uh, that you're using, and Scatter can do that. Um, and, you know, the, the reason that we use the scattering vector is it makes the, the x-axis uh, independent of distance to the detector and the wavelength. So, you know, whatever distance you use, whatever wavelength you do, you convert it to Q and everything's on the same axis. Okay. Um, and as Greg was pointing out, um, what you're looking here at an at a, at a image of, of the, um, uh, from the detector is you go around in a circle uh, and you, you take that average around the circle here, around the center of the beam stop, uh, you'll get a single point here. And you just keep going out further and further and further. And then you start to see that you have features uh, in, in the subtracted Sachs curve. So this is a subtracted Sachs curve. This you wouldn't have a subtracted image here. Um, so, what the, the errors are typically errors in counting, right? So as you, as you go around in the circle, uh, you have uh, counts on the, on the pixel, and so you're doing the uh, Poisson uh, counting, counting statistics. Um, the, if there's any issues with, with the instrument itself, so if the beam stop is, is misaligned slightly, or you, you get scatter from the slits, or some issue with the detector, uh, typically, you, when, you, when you do the subtraction between the background or your buffer and the sample, a lot of these things just subtract out of way. But sometimes they don't, right? Sometimes uh, there might be a little bit of a vibration that you catch or something moves a little bit. And you'll see, like, especially with the misalignment of the beam stop, if the beam stop moves, you'll have some um, uh, uh, flaring uh, around the beam stop. Um, and what you see here in white is the actual beam stop. This was at Sybil's from a long time ago. Um, and what, what your beamline scientists will do is they mask uh, all this out so that when they do the average, uh, you skip this part. Um, and, you know, obviously if the mask is incorrect, um, you'll, you'll have some issues here in the subtraction sometimes. And so you, you should uh, ask your beamline scientists to redo the mask if you see a problem. Okay. So, uh, Sachs, remember, uh, you, whatever you put in the beam, it's going to scatter. Nothing goes missing in Sachs. That's a, that's a good thing and a bad thing. So, um, that means if you have a sample with, with dimers, monomers, and aggregates, you're going to see the whole lot. Um, so, and, and as Greg was referring to earlier, you know, what you should really, the take home message is that Sachs is a difference measurement. So, that means uh, it's a measurement of two. You're measuring your sample and your buffer. And, and you have to treat your buffer uh, just as special as your sample because this is a difference measurement. So that means that your buffer uh, has to be perfectly matched to the components with the exception of the particle that you're measuring uh, of the sample. So when you subtract the two, you remove 
uh, the contributions of the buffer. Um, and, and so, you know, the reason that we like size exclusion chromatography sacks so much these days is that it takes a lot of that, that um, uh, problem with buffer mismatching uh, out of the equation. Uh, so normally when we talk about like bio sacks, we're doing bio sacks, is that we're doing sacks at, at dilute conditions. So that means that uh, under dilute conditions, we're going to measure what we call the particle form factor. Okay, so this is, as Greg was showing earlier, it's the scattering due to the kind of the shape of, of the particle and not how particles are interacting with each other. If you go to really high concentrations, you might see correlations between the particles. And these correlations, what we will refer to as like a structure factor. Um, but like I said, we want to do this under sufficiently dilute conditions that the shape of the scattering curve uh, remains constant. Um, and if you have your scattering curve here, which we call, we measure in reciprocal space, uh, we do a uh, Fourier transform inversion, and we can recover uh, uh, what we call the, the real space signal or the pair distance distribution function. This is the set of all pairwise distances within the particle. Uh, it's a thermodynamic measurement because if you think about it, you're measuring roughly a thousand billion molecules. So you're going to see, you know, if you have a purified your protein, it's essentially a conformational landscape of your, of your protein. Um, and, you know, change temperature, add a ligand, if the conformation, if the distribution of conformations changes, then the P of R distribution should change, right? Make sense? So, um, like I was saying, when we do a difference measurement in SACs, you know, if you think about uh, our x-rays coming through here, um, they're going to hit your, your little uh, protein particle, right? And then you're going to get x-ray scattering off of all the buffer stuff here in blue. Um, and then the, the scattering off your little protein here. And then we're going to subtract that from a buffer, right? And what's, what's missing in the buffer is essentially uh, the particle, right? But the particle has its like little ghost uh, complementary buddy here, right? So it's called the ghost, right? So um, if you subtract the two, then the, what you're not taking into account, uh, what's left over is the scattering of the protein and then this excluded volume scattering, okay? And so what you'll see in programs like FOXs and Chrysol is that they have these corrections for like the excluded volume. And you should recognize that this difference, so the intensity of the particle that we get, uh, the sample, it, it's equal to the difference between the intensity of the sample uh, minus the intensity of the buffer, okay? So this difference, remember, is taken in the domain of the real numbers, right? There's no imaginary numbers here. Okay, so the two kinds of data collections that we, we kind of process with scatter um, is batch mode uh, experiments where you prepare samples like in a plate and you manually load it in a cuvette. Uh, you know, sample volumes are typically between 20 to 35 microliters uh, per, per, per uh, well. And, you know, this might be good for condition screening. So you might be looking at a variety of different pHs, uh, the, the effects of different buffers, you know, additives like sucrose and glycerol. You can do uh, ligand screening. I ask a question, if I mix my protein A with protein B, does it make it complex? Um, and so these batch mode experiments um, we'll have issues with, with uh, um, buffer matching, but if you're really just solely interested in, in, in uh, low resolution information, then the quality of the buffer match really affects the, the, the uh, extent of the higher, higher resolution information you can extract. So uh, the poorer the buffer match, the, the, the uh, lower the resolution that, that you can uh, get out of the experiment. Um, the other kind of experiment that you can do with SACs that we do in BioSACs is what we call sex SACs. Um, and so here uh, you can use like a 2.4 to 4.8 mil column, uh, 30 to 50 microliters of sample are injected. You expect about a three and a half fold dilution. So if you inject about seven mg per mil, your peak fraction, right? Your peak fraction given that uh, most of it is contained within the protein is about two mg per mil. And you can typically get a great signal between 0.9 to 1 mg per mil. Um, if you cannot concentrate your, your particle, maybe try repeated runs at a low concentration and average like 10 times. So uh, again, that would take up a lot of time, but if that's what you have to do. And so what you're doing then in these experiments is that you have uh, your, your size exclusion system running, x-rays are coming through the capillary, 
and then you're just exposing and, and collecting frames off the detector. Um, what you should recognize here is that um, if you're using something like a, a capillary, you could have issues of capillary fouling where the protein deposits onto the capillary. Um, and the way that we would see that here is that if you look at the baseline scattering, um, you would have an elevated baseline after the main peak comes off. This usually happens if you're gonna be shooting in like super high concentrations, like greater than 15 mg per mil, and you have some buffer-like PBS, uh, as simple as possible. So you can get radiation um, capillary fouling in a flow experiment, and that's something to look out for. Okay, so <clears throat> the kind of noise that you'll see come through uh, your, your scattering, uh, I'm gonna go through this quickly, but you can have slides. Uh, you, you tend to have scattering off of things like your slits, uh, possibly your mirror is going to add some background noise, but all this stuff, you know, all the all the stuff that the uh, inside the instrument that the X-rays interact with will contribute to instrumentation scattering, right? Like I was saying earlier, um, we remove these contributions through the difference measurement, given that everything remains the same. This might become an issue if you're collecting down at like 10 microseconds, but normally you're in the hundreds of millisecond uh, exposure times. Um, but this is a good example where we have a difference curve. This is a BSA, and we have uh, this flaring around the beam stop was happening because um, the, the, there was a kind of like a, um, uh, a slow movement of the beam stop during the measurement. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, this is bad, right? <laughs> and what you'd have to do in the pro manual processing of the data, hopefully, is cut back uh, this part of the data, and you still have enough information around the Guinea region uh, to, to give you some meaningful information. But the caveat to that is that this, this uplift that you're having here is also going to be uplifting your Guinea region slightly, so you may overestimate it. And that's your Guinea region. Um, the other thing that happens in SACS um, is, is radiation damage of the sample, and so uh, this is a, a uh, 30, uh, 30 second exposure. So we collected 30 frames. Each frame is one second. So we open up the, the slits, open up the, um, turn on the detector, collected 30 frames. And what you can see here is that, um, you know, sample is just static, it's not moving. Is as, as, uh, we, as we go to 30 seconds, the radius of gyration in I0 are increasing. And this is uh, informing us that we have uh, radiation damage and that if you're going to merge this data you would likely only use the uh, first uh, two to four frames and you would have to get rid of the rest of the uh, experiment and so um, that this was done in, in uh, PBS right so uh, buffer and this is where we kind of went a little crazy with it and did a very long exposure uh, and we can see that with this protein uh, BSA that uh, in PBS alone, um, as we're collecting the frames, as we get to a certain dose, uh, the, the um, uh, radiation gyration is increasing, again, in telling us that we have radiation damage or aggregation occurring. Now, what you can do to mitigate that is add some kind of um, uh, additive, uh, like sucrose, glycerol, potassium, sodium nitrate, uh, heapies, and what, if you look at this here, if we take PBS and add uh, potassium nitrate and sucrose, uh, through that same dose experiment, we don't see any, any uh, increase in the radius gyration. So, you know, when you, when you do SACS and you see that you're, maybe your, your sample is, is sensitive to radiation damage, um, perhaps you can uh, think about uh, increasing, like if it's TRIS, maybe go to 100 millimolar TRIS, or, you know, have an additive like sucrose to help uh, deal with that. So to summarize briefly, um, when we look at our data, um, we have low Q issues, which will be beam stop noise and aggregation. This is going to bias the Guinea region. Uh, we can we can be uh, mitigated via truncation, but like I said, this will, this still causes a you know a bias to the Guinea region. Uh, this is going to be critical to modeling. So if you think about uh, things like Dam and Gasbor, Denver, whatever, um, they really bias the low Q intensities because they do this one over the Q to four weighting of the, of, the, of the information. And so, you know, if you have the slightest amount of aggregation in there, you're going to probably cause a slight elongation of the model and then, you know, be creative with your interpretation. Um, in the high Q, uh, 
uh, your usable data is going to be determined, well, you know, essentially how well the counts are measured. Like Greg was saying that very few counts are going to be measured at the highest Q. So if you really need that information out there, then you're going to have to extend the exposure time. Um, and then you'll be prone to like uh, uh, radiation damage. The other thing that's going to uh, affect your high Q is your quality of the buffer matching, right? So uh, doing site exclusion chromatography sacks is a method that, that would, uh, you know, near, nearly guarantee a perfect match. So maybe you should do that instead of like a batch experiment. Uh, one way to, to look at the, high, the quality of the high Q region is to inspect what we call the integrated intensity plot. Um, and then the other kind of thing that you can see is when we start to determine the P of R distribution, uh, if you're finding that you're having a lot of difficulties and you have to truncate the data, then that's likely informing that your high Q data is corrupting that you should probably exclude. Okay, so when we analyze SACS data using scatter, uh, we're, we're interested uh, in the beginning just looking at what we call the SACS invariance. Okay, so these are things like the Polaroid volume, which is the uh, uh, volume, if you think of it, the, it's the effective volume of the scattering particle, the correlation length. Um, so this is how well the particle correlates with itself under small displacements. Uh, radius of gyration, this is the distribution of mass. Uh, so you can see it's formally defined as the second moment of the P of R distribution. Um, and then you can also get what we call the volume of correlation. Um, and what this is, is the uh, I0. Remember, so I0, what it is, it's the squared volume of the particle uh, divided by the, the integrated intensity here, Q times I of Q. Um, and if you carry the math out, it's equal to the volume of the correlation length. Uh, what's interesting about this equation here, this bottom part, is that it approaches a constant value uh, as you go to high Q. And what this looks like effectively is that um, if you plot out Q times I of Q against DQ, um, you can see that uh, as we go to the higher and higher Q values, that this approaches a constant value. So this is what the theory is predicting. When you have poor buffer matching, so if you're over subtracting or under subtracting, what you'll see is either a linear increase to high Q or a linear decrease, okay? So, and that's again informing us that maybe with this plot, we should cut the data back and maybe try and do a P of R distribution around here and not uh, transform the entire data set. Okay, so um, the other thing we do with SACS is once you have your SACS curve is you, you wanna determine the P of R distribution. Um, and so the, uh, the way you wanna think about this is that given, given a SACS curve, you know, this goes out to about 0.32, um, if you got a new detector like an Iger and you double the number of data points, do you, and, and, and the Q range is the same, uh, do you increase the information in the experiment? So, uh, you know, the answer to this is no, the, the information content remains the same. The only way you get more information is by collecting to higher Q. And so for very small particles, then what all these data points mean is that um, if you wanted to effectively uh, represent this curve, how many points do you need? Uh, that are equally spaced and you need for a D max of 43, six points uh, to a Q max of 0.42. Um, <clears throat> and so that means uh, SACS data is very redundant. We, we have a lot of data points and we can use that redundancy or exploit that redundancy to recover the P of R distribution. And this is what it looks like. So here we collected data at Sybils that had an I over Q of, uh, uh, I over sigma uh, of one at the high Q. And then here's I over sigma 3.3. Um, so if we extract the P of R distributions from both, so uh, you can see that there's a perfect overlay between them. And so what, what this means is that we're allowed to extract error-free the uh, P of R distribution, given that the buffer subtraction is you know, ideal, right? If you have any errors in buffer subtraction, you can't do this. And this is called the noisy coding channel theorem. Um, so this is why, you know, when you measure your SACS curve and you want to compare, uh, let's say, uh, the bound state and the free state, it's always good to compare it in real space and not in reciprocal space. Because it's misleading to look at it this way because you might be too focused in the low Q when you should really be looking at the P of R distribution. Okay, so there's very different methods to do it, to go from uh, uh, reciprocal space to real space. Uh, one method is called GNOME. This is a very popular method by Spheregen's group at the EMBL. It's part of the ATSAS package. There's uh, the original method, which is Gladders, uh, called GIFT, I think. It may have changed again. Um, and 
then there's uh, my method in scatter. There's two here, but there's actually, I think, four different ways to do it. But we'll, we'll go over that on the uh, uh, tutorial. Um, but basically, you, the answer, as you do this, it's an iterative process. You expect that the P of R distribution be a smooth curve. You want to have minimal oscillations. Uh, for all practical purposes, no negative values. Sometimes you get it with uh, looking at detergents. Um, and these methods assume a single Dmax. So there's only one Dmax that you're looking at here to describe the uh, P of R distribution for the mixture. And then the other reason I really like looking at things in terms of the P of R distribution is that if you think about it like this, where you have an RNA here, this is a P of R distribution for the RNA. Then you have the P of R distribution for the protein in gray. Then if they form a complex, you get this massive new increase in, in, in distances, which are the cross terms, right? So what this is telling us is like, you know, if we, if we know the structure of the RNA and we know the structure of the protein, we do have sufficient information to put the complex together because you just have so many cross terms defined in between them. Um, but, you know, it's independent. So hopefully Mikel will go over some examples of that with Fox Um And so, you know, like I said, the P of R distribution is the best, best method to assert conformational changes. Um, <clears throat> small changes may not produce changes in the radius gyration. So what I mean by that is that your guinea region may, may not be sensitive enough to see it. Um, but what we're looking at here is the SAM ribose switch in the presence and absence of S adenosyl methionine. And what you can see that in the presence of SAM, SAM is a very small molecule about the size of ATP, is that there's a very big change in the P of R distribution. This would be a massive change in the radius gyration, and you would expect that the two curves would look very different when in fact they do. But in this case with the lysine ribose switch, you can see in the presence and absence of lysine that the conformation is, is subtle. It's a very small change. And if you overlay the two curves, it's hard to really assert confidently that change. And that's why it's best to look at this in terms of the P of R distribution. Um, because again, remember each point in the P of R distribution is the Fourier transform of the entire data set. Okay, so uh, to move on, you have this thing called the poroid invariant. So the poroid invariant, um, this is how we understand flexibility in sex, is that Poroid um, predicted that if you have a compact particle with a defined electron density between its solvent and itself, then uh, the curve Q squared times I of Q should approach a constant value. And uh, the way that looks is you can see it here in blue with the very compact folded protein glucose isomerase, is that if we plot Q times I of Q, you can see that it captures a defined area under the curve, and we would call that compact. Um, if the, the system is flexible and unfolded, you can see that that same plot shows kind of this uh, plateau and this slow convergence to baseline. And so this is kind of the basis for how we use SACS to kind of understand that uh, a polymer that we're looking at or a protein is flexible or compact. Um, Poroid's law also, uh, he came up with this thing where um, if you plot the data Q, time, uh, Q to the fourth times I of Q, it should approach a constant value. So Q, so the plot would be Q to the four times the intensity approaches a constant value. Um, keep this in mind because we're going to look at uh, Debye's uh, thing. So uh, I, I think there's like three different structural states that we can assess by SACS readily. One is what we call uncorrelated flexibility. So that's if you imagine uh, two compact things moving independent of each other, but they're, they're somewhat tethered, right? So here we would expect that the poroid volume to be larger than expected, but the, the thing that we call the poroid exponent would be around four. You have correlated flexibility. So correlated flexibility is like an implied string between them. Um, the, the volume that you would calculate from this type of particle would be larger than expected. And this thing that we call the poroid exponent would be less than four. And then finally, what you have is a discrete rigid state, something like calmodulin. So the volume uh, of the particle should be close to the ideal density of 1.3. The poroid exponent will be near four. Um, but now what is this poroid Debye exponent? So Debye predicted that if you plot the intensity of the data against Q squared, it should approach a constant value. Um, and this was for a Gaussian coil. Poroid predicted if you plot uh, for a compact particle, Q to the four times I of Q, it should approach a constant value. So what you have here is this number that goes between two and four, 
And all you have to do is kind of find where this uh, region exists in the data and fit it to get an idea of what the Freud the by exponent is. Um, and I'll show you uh, with, this, with this example, not this one. Okay, here we go. So, um, so if you if you think about this equation here, you put n here times i of q. If you take the natural log of it, then you'll what you'll get is the exponent on a natural on a power law plot. Um, and if we look at something like rad fifty one ap one uh, attached to maltose binding protein, which is a compact particle, what you can see is that for an intrinsically disordered protein, rad fifty one ap one, the cracky plot is just showing you this this uh, uh, severe lack of convergence to baseline. Um, essentially hyperbolic, whereas when we add this to a compact discrete particle, you can see uh, some convergence to the baseline, uh, but not completely. So this is telling us that we have kind of a biphasic system. If you calculate the volume from this, it comes out um, 145,000, which is overestimating it. Um, and then if we make this Q to the 4, Q to the 4 plot here, Q to the 4 intensity, you can see that there's a poroid plateau um, at some point, so the, the data is forming this plateau uh, for the, the mixed particle, but for the rad 51 ap one only, uh, it just keeps going. Okay, so yeah, so your proid exponent, like I was saying, is if we just take the natural log of the intensities, then what we'll get out of that is this exponent that we can fit. And so this is an example where if we take the um, uh, SACS data, do this power law plot, and then fit a line to this decay, then we can determine the poroid exponent. So for the lysine ribose switch in the presence of magnesium, we get a poroid exponent of 3.4. And if we take away the magnesium and the lysine, we get a poroid exponent of two. So this is what a Gaussian coil was predicted to be, and this is going towards what a compact particle would be. And so this is kind of a semi, you know, quantitative way of assessing changes in flexibility, and this this is a really good way to look at the same system. You know, when you're when you're you have a mutation or you're adding or adding a ligand or changing a buffer, you, you could just look at the proid exponent to get some idea of how your, your sample is changing. Okay, so in scatter, what we do is we we have this thing called the flexibility plot. Says we want to go down this road to try and determine the proid exponent, and what we'll do is we plot it four different ways. And then we want to find out roughly where this plateau uh, stops, right? So you can see here for the red curve, it stops right around here. This is important for scatter because it sets the, the Q max. And, and I'll show you in the uh, practical. Um, the other thing that you can do with scatter is the dimensionless cracky plot. And this is really an amazing uh, way to look at the data. But the you know, major caveat to that, of course, is that it re requires an I0 and RG estimate. And that means that your I0 and RG estimate must be unbiased. So you don't, you know, you don't want to have any beam stop or aggregation nonsense in it, because then that'll distort the plot. But um, what it is, is, you know, instead of plotting Q squared times I of Q against Q, what we're going to do is uh, uh, remove the units here, because this is going to be an inverse angstrom squares, and this is an inverse angstrom. And so the way that we do that is um, by multiplying, dividing by I0, multiplying by uh, RG, Q, RG squared here, and then by RG down here. And so if you do that for... Um, these are some examples here. So this is, if you look at xylanase at 21 kilodaltons versus glucose isomerase at 173 kilodaltons, both of these proteins are globular compact proteins. You see that um, the peak in the, in, the, in the dimensionless cracky plot occurs roughly at the square root of three and 1.104. Um, this is what we call a guinea cracky point, and it's predicted to, to be, um, Particles that are globular will have a peak uh, at this position. And as you uh, become unfolded or flexible, you'll either see a shift in the peak. Um, uh, in the case of RAD51 AP1, the peak is completely gone. But in the biphasic system, you still have this peak, right? But you can see that the maximum value, I think, is about 2. Yeah, it has to be less than 2. So the, in this form of the graph, you're really bound between uh, 1.104 and 2. Okay, um, so again, if you're doing some kind of folding study, some kind of ligand study, 
this is a very good comparative plot uh, to kind of see, uh, you know, is my, is my system changing when I do something to it, right? And this is a really great example of, when, uh, of a protein that binds an RNA. So the RNA is roughly eight kilodaltons. So in the absence of RNA, the protein you can see in the dimensionless crack heap plot, you would say is, is partially unfolded or very flexible, right? It has, it has this peak. So it's probably you know, at least a multi-domain protein with, with uh, flexible bits to it. But then when we add the RNA, uh, it collapses down into a globular compact particle. And, and again, there's no modeling here. You're just looking at the data this way and you can really make a good assessment about what's going on uh, without, without going to the advanced modeling stuff. Yet. Um, but this should also tell you that if I have data that looks like this in black, you should probably not do the ab initio volumetric modeling because you're just going to get a big blob of stuff, right? You know? Um, okay, so let's go over uh, scatter real quick. How do I, how do I change, Greg? Let's see. Do I just close the window? Okay. You have another probably 17, 20 minutes. Okay. It's 27, 30 minutes. Maybe 15 because I wish to have a discussion. So you can just shut it down by 15, 17 minutes. So if I share my desktop, you're going to see it, right? But which desktop am I sharing? Here we go. Okay, do you see my desktop? Yes. Okay. I'm going to close this. So we, we have bioisis. It's been, uh, do you guys see this right here, bioisis? Yes. Okay. okay. So th this has a, a lot of the t uh, tutorials on how to use Scatter 4. It'll be up next week. I've been rebuilding the whole thing um, uh, to include the new the new scatter stuff. Okay, um, but you know you can click through it. Guinea analysis, Guinea peak analysis, all that stuff. Okay, so um, let me start scatter. You going over the code now of the scatter? That's no, perfect. I'm just starting it. If you want to go over the code? We can. Where did it go? Where did it go? Okay, do you see scattered? Yes. Okay. So scatter has um, these little six tabs on the side and then these buttons that do a variety of different things. So to process size exclusion chromatography data, we go to SEC. Um, and when you- Sorry, when Rob, you, um, so Excuse me, can you make it bigger, uh, the screen? Because we're seeing a lot of stuff in the background. Thanks. What about now? Better. Yeah. Maybe yeah. close the other things that you don't need. Anyway, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So I, I'm not sure how data is processed at Civils, but at Diamond, when it comes off the detector, we have individual frames individual DAT files and they're indexed. Um, and so we load that whole index set. Uh, so if you have, you know, you might have 2000 frames and each frame is like, you know, one second over the course of the size exclusion chromatography run. So to load data like that, so it has to be indexed either on the left or right hand side with, with, a, with a core, with a base file name, you just drag one over and then it's gonna go through and load it, hopefully. So it's loading, it's 2%. This takes a while, um, maybe a minute. Would you like to answer some questions while we're waiting? Sure. Okay, just uh, real quick from um, Gundeep, he asks, can we estimate the resolution of a SACS data set? If yes, how? If that's a quick answer. Yeah, I mean, you want to estimate the usable QMAX, right? And that's this whole process we're going to go through. So I, to me personally, it's the maximum Q value that supports uh, the P of R distribution. We need to also consider the difference between the resolution in a SACS data versus resolution in a model 
So it's a, yeah, more it's, diff a diff it's, complete. it's a difficult and different discussion, but you're right. The Q max is the maximal tractable scattering dot signal defined at resolution of the data. Okay. So everything is loaded. There's a whole bunch of frames. You can see in the corner here, it says nanometers to angstrom. So if you collect it at BM29, you may want to uh, hit that button first. And then uh, there's also this auto RG button, but that doesn't apply. So you want to give it a name. So the name here is MABS uh, sec2. And then if we just, so what you want, after all the frames load, you just click trace. And what that's doing is it's processing the whole data set uh, it's trying to estimate what it thinks is the background. Um, and then it's going to subtract that estimated background from all the other frames. And then it's going to do um, uh, an RG calculation over some of the frames. Um, and then it'll write a composite file that we call a .sec file. Um, and then that .sec file contains all the information for downstream processing. I'll show you what that means. Okay, so if you see here, there's this uh, thing that says uh, a signal threshold of 1.1, and then you have um, uh, exclude start starting points. So it'll ignore the first 17 points in the auto RG. So this signal threshold of 1.1, that's this. So you can see 1.1. So what that's gonna do is that anything above 1.1, um, it will calculate an RG for uh, if you look here, the points in gray, so there's, there's blue and then gray. The points in gray are uh, the points that scatter guessed at what it should be the buffer, okay? Um, and if you like that, that's good, keep it. If you don't, then you could reset it. So if you wanna do that, you just highlight this whole thing. It's a lot of points. And then you just wanna hit set buffer. And then that'll use that whole thing as buffer, right? Um, and to keep it, you have to hit update. So update will then reprocess the whole thing, redo the subtraction, and then you're done. Okay, make sense? All right, um, but we're not gonna do that. So if you, if you then take your mouse and you highlight over kind of the peak here, what, what's going on here is this, this window um, will then show you this, this uh, grabbed region, right? And then what you're seeing in red here is the RG that's calculated across the peak um, based on that threshold. And what's underneath here is a similarity plot. So uh, what you're doing here is, is the question you're asking, I could say, starting at frame 450, right? You can see the mouse, the mouse is at frame 450 here. Um, and I go up, the y-axis, right? So I'm at like frame 470 here. What you're asking is how similar are those frames between 450 and 470? And I give it a color. So if you're really similar, it's cyan. And as you move away from cyan to blue to red to purple, you get even more different, right? And so if you just click on that, that shows you that selected set of frames, right? And you know, underneath it, the very bottom here is subtracted frames. So you could just kind of use your mouse cursor to go through it if you want to see what the other subtracted frames look like. This is always good if you have some funny business going around a beam stop. You could kind of just uh, mouse through to see if you see like, you know, some kind of systematic flaring. But that doesn't matter. So what we're going to do is, is just kind of um, click. I'm just going to click here. Uh, and I have... about 10 frames, I'm gonna merge. Um, yeah, just click merge, we'll merge it. Okay, that's done. So um, what I wanna show you is, so let's just go ahead and clear everything out. So when you, when you process the data, and made that initial .sec file. It um, here it is. It Rob, there is a, <coughs> Rob, there is a very important question. So I'm just gonna break yeah. it up a little bit. Uh, how do you calculate the similarity map uh, versus 
Who else it's is using asking? it's using it's using what's called the Durbin Watson statistics. So if two things are exactly the same, the residuals should be random, right? Why it's you so didn't use the volatility ratio? I looked at a lot of things and this is what seemed to work quite well for this. Okay, it's uh, magic, okay. Yeah, but the Durbin-Watson statistic, um, random, what's neat about it is uh, if, if something is random, the distribution that you calculate, the number you calculate comes out to two, right? And if you're positive or negatively correlated, it'll, it'll oscillate between uh, zero and two and two and four. So you square it and you get this nice color map. Okay, so, if you, if you, um, once we do the merge, you'll get a PDF file. And this PDF file shows you your Sachs curve. I mean, it shows you the size exclusion trace. It shows you the frames that you use to make your buffer. It shows you the overlay of all the frames that are scaled to each other. It shows you the Durbin Watson statistic calculated from the first frame. So it should be flat if it goes up or down and you got a problem. This is the Shapiro-Wilkes statistic, which is another way to assess the randomness. You also see an I0 RG plot, so this should be flat, it looks good. And then this is the overlay of the average, uh, uh, av the average and the median. And then if you go down here, it kind of explains all that other stuff. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is that you get, is you get this .sec file. Okay, so if you wanted to go back to your size exclusion data and process it or look at it again, you just have to load the .sec file. You don't have to load the thousand frames. And because it's all processed um, uh, ahead of time, it loads quickly and you can just get right back to it. You don't have to worry about loading times and all that other stuff. Okay, but like I said, if you wanted to reprocess the buffer, then you have to uh, set the buffer, hit update, and then that'll overwrite the old sec file. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so then, so this is your Sachs curve. Um, if you didn't have one in here, uh, you could just load, load one. Let's see if I have one here. All right. You just drag and drop into the, the, the empty space at the bottom here, and then you get your curve. So what we want to do here is look at the Gagné region first for this one. Um, which comes up on my other screen. So you can see that the residuals, they kind of have um, a smile to it, so that's not good. And what we're trying to do here is cut out a lot of that, that bias, right? Uh, this, this was actually collected at an absurd concentration, so uh, that's what they wanted to do. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the normalized cracky plot now. And then uh, what comes up is this plot here. So because we determine RG and I0, you hit normalized cracky, it brings up this plot. You can see the guinea cracky point. So uh, we would say that this isn't quite a globular particle, but it has a lot of, uh, it's converging to baseline. So it's, it's likely, you know, well folded, right? Um, the the guinea peak analysis um, is a nice plot. So if you really wanted to kind of look at, uh, problematic data in the Guinea region, you can bring this up. And what this is showing you in red is the ideal uh, curve for something uh, behaving as a globular particle following Guinea's uh, law, if you will. Um, and so what you wanna do here is just kind of trim the data to really try and fit uh, this, this most of the curve around this part. Um, that's, a, that's an extreme case. So then, what we're going to do next is look at the flexibility plot. So what we want to do here is try and get our porid exponent. So we hit that, we drag back this radio button to find a plateau, uh, kind of a, in the lowest Q region. You can see it plateaus roughly right around here. Um, and what that does is it sets the Q max for this next button that we press. So when we hit volume, it brings up a new plot and this volume button um, stops where, where we stop the radio button. And all we want to do now is just kind of fit a line to this region. This is the residuals of the fit here. And you can see the port exponent is around three and a half. Okay, so um, finally you can kind of get an idea what the quality of the uh, background subtraction is. Um, 
And you can see that the data um, doesn't quite turn over. It starts to kind of uplift uh, right around 0 0.3, 0 0.28. Um, so what we want to do is remember that because it becomes important for the P of R distribution. So if I click on the P of R distribution, uh, so we, we have a find Dmax algorithm. So if you right click on, on it and hit find Dmax, uh, it comes up to about 0.28, like I was kind of guessing it. Um, we give it a, a range of Dmax values and then uh, don't worry about the alpha, just hit start. It's gonna take a few minutes, so any questions? Yeah, I, I have a question, Rob. I mean, there have been no more question at our chat so far, but uh, Scott was also posting uh, a note that we can upload, or you guys can upload the Sketcher device version, Sketcher 4 from, uh, from our homepage, mm -hmm. as the biases is down right now. But can you comment a little bit when you talk about normalized graphic plot and you said properly that it's very good case to distinguish in case you get a ligand by the same system for drugs and how it's uh, the flexibility change. But I have uh, users, they asking all the time same question, how we can treat the normalized crafty plot for different systems, especially when you have something that is very elongated. And you know, for the elongated particles, the normalized crafty plot or any crafty plot can be a little confusing. Yeah, so doesn't... what's your point on, um, study the flexibility versus elongation using normalized graphic plot. Yeah, I, I think, I, so the issue with something very elongated, um, as long as you don't exceed kind of the limitations of the camera itself, right? So let's say like a coil coil protein, right? Um, and and those, those are folded, you know, you would say they're folded and compact, but they're elongated. Um, the normalized cracky plot is not going to be, uh, it would be unreliable in, in, in telling you that it's unfolded, right? It, you know, you, you just already know the system. So, um, and what happens there, I think, with, with um, uh, we see with the poroid to bi exponent is as you, if something starts that's compact at four, compact and globular, it's, it has a poroid exponent of four. And then as it becomes more elongated, like what we saw with the lysine ribose switch, that number will move down to about uh, closer to three, 3 3.2, 3.4 in that, in that neighborhood. Um, what I haven't seen yet is something that is, you know, elongated, um, that's like a really stiff rod, but it has a poroid exponent of less than three. Okay. So I think what's important there is you look at the, the normalized crack heat plot, you also want to get an idea of what the poroid Debye exponent is, right? Okay. So if you're under three and it's showing, flex, you know, that it's unfolded, then it likely is unfolded, right? But I actually have some data. We could look at it on a, on a. Yeah, um, I don't want to cut you too much, but uh, you have probably another five minutes if it's okay. Okay. Um, so this is too short, <laughs> but what you can see, this is the the. Uh, P of R distribution that, that uh, it guessed at. So it looked at a whole bunch of them, scored them, and then it looks like it's right around 180. But you could see that um, the likelihood score was peaking out in that area. So what you want to do is um, kind of extend that range and then uh, give it another go. This is a, I think this is a heavily glycosylated antibody, if I remember right. Rob, we have another question if you wanna, can you answer it real quick before this? Sure. It's just from uh, Gundeep again. What's the difference between dimensionless and normalized cranky plot? No, uh, they're one and the same. Um, I think they're, you'll see in the literature that they're used interchangeably. I think dimensionless, Dimensionless means the axes have no dimensions, right? So uh, if you multiply x axes by r g, um, you're multiplying inverse angstrom times angstrom, so they cross out. Same with the y axis. But it's normalized, right? Because you normalize it to i0, so you're normalizing it to the concentration and, and size of the particle. So 
you'll see it in the literature used interchangeably. Um, okay, it's still growing. There you go. So what you see is the likelihood score peaks out at about 200, and this is telling you roughly that you should be uh, looking at a Dmax in this neighborhood, and that your P of R distribution is going to look something like that. Okay, and you can see that it kind of has this kind of longish tail to it, and it's probably because it has some uh, flexible bits on it that that aren't quite compact. Because normally this, you know, if it's really compact, it just kind of drops down right to the baseline. You see this elongated stuff here. Okay, uh, is that it? Is is it my time? Do you need? Oh, let me do question. one more thing. Hold on. Yeah, so, a, no, no, I have a question back. You can go back to PRR functions, very important, I think, for everybody. Okay. So, <clears throat> again, it's antibody, as I show from the name, and you're explaining some unfolding or some kind of extension coming out of the antibodies from the PRR function. But you also discuss, because this is size exclusion, uh, sex collected profile, that's right. If I'm correct. Yeah, it was sex sex. Yeah. So, uh, but you also discussed that due to experimental errors or due to capillary falling, you may have a problem in the guinea. Yeah. Well, you did some very fast guinea analysis there and briefly to show that it's kind of linear. But how do you sure that your experimentals, I would say, errors or the capillary, capillary falling do not cause uh, this distortion and extension in uh, your R function. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so if you add back all the data- Be honest. Using, what? Try to be honest. Yeah, so if you, if you add back all the data and you look at the RG that we calculated, uh, you can see that the residuals are on one side here, so it's strongly biased to one side, right? So if your model was, uh, if you, so if your Guinea model was correct, then you would expect that the residuals to be random around the red line instead of biased to one side. Um, and you can see like, you know, it comes down and, and, and gets near the red line right around 0. 0.0003. So to me, I, I would cut that data back uh, there, right? And, you know, aggregation is always kind of this uplift in the data, right? Um, and, um, or you could get frowning, but in this case, it's kind of the So that's why I cut it back. Uh, but, you know, and then you can see that the, the residuals now are, are uh, more randomized around the red line. Okay, so that's just, that's just kind of looking at trying to fit the Guinea model uh, to the low Q uh, data. Okay, so, you know, if you go to the P of R distribution here, let's see what happens if you add it back. You probably need a really long D max, is what I'm guessing. Okay, oh yeah, before I forget this score here, um, it should be as low as possible, right? Um, so that's, that's what the search is looking for, right? Um, but yeah, you gotta keep going. And look, it's really, it's really like rough. This is what I mean, if, you, if you're having a hard time, finding out what you're um, getting a nice P of R distribution, then you want to either look at cutting the low Q data out or truncating the high Q, right? So the low Q is like, we, we already knew that we had suspected some issues with, with the data just by looking at the Guinea fit. And so that's why we would cut it out. Um, the other thing you can do is this plot Q times I of Q plot here, this little button right here. What I like about that is that it shows me if I have any points going below zero, right? So uh, practically, you shouldn't have negative uh, intensities in, in, in fitting the data or lots of them. And if you do, then it probably means that your signal to noise is really close to, close to each other. So again, you want to truncate the data back till you get um, uh, more positive than negative. Um, anyways. So one, one last thing before, before we uh, sign off here is uh, if you click on the, the, the curve, uh, click on the, the data of interest uh, and right click, you could go to create report from single data set. Um, 
And then that brings up this tiny little box. So uh, and then you could just, uh, that's right, source. Something, you know, I just made that up. There was also a question, then you have a time later. How do you get the GNOME output file from Scheduler? <laughs> later. Okay, okay. So, so if you do that, you hit OK. okay. Oh, yeah. So it'll, it'll write a PDF file uh, that summarizes everything that you did. So it has the SACS data that you use, the, the Q, um, starting from the Q min, uh, from the Guinea. Then it has um, the normalized cracky plot, uh, that wonky P of R distribution we came up with, this Q times I of Q plot. What you typed in that little box goes here, right? So advanced light source workshop example. It shows you the Guinea fit, uh, the residuals of that fit. You get a nice table. Uh, summarizing all the results. So, you know, as, as you do this analysis through your data set quickly, uh, write the report, then you have it there for uh, going, referring back to it as you write your paper, basically. Okay. So, so, sorry, Rob, I tried to really keep it in the rain, in the frame. So I think the last question is really, uh, we're gonna go back to this together. So we're gonna show more tools. So no worries about that. We're gonna show also um, more about our tools and also Jesse tools. Uh, would you mind tell us how to do the GNOME output file from your schedule? Oh, right here, right now? Okay. You want, yeah, okay. So, um, <clears throat> let's see if this works now. So your ad SAS, you have to go to settings and in settings you have to set your um, uh, directory. And <clears throat> what I found out was on Macs, at SAS seems to only work with version three. Okay, um, I don't know why, uh, but but you set the bin directory where where the where the executables are. Okay, and then um, let's try to do that. Okay, so then if you do to file, give it a name. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> It'll automatically run dat gnome. Now, the problem with uh, dat gnome is it's guessing at um, uh, what it thinks is uh, the, the usable Q range and what it thinks the Dmax is. And sometimes when you have data that has aggregation in it or radiation damage, uh, what you get with scatter and what dat gnome is producing are going to be miles apart. Okay. Um, so it's always good after you run uh, that gnome that you inspect the file to make to see what the Dmax is you've got. So I'm going to go ahead and open it with just a text editor. So if you go all the way to the bottom, it's coming out with the Dmax of 244. And then it's Q, the Q value that it stopped at was 0.15. So it chopped out half the data to get to that Dmax. Okay. So now that's really informative too, because you know it's telling you there's some there's some issue with the data, right? And it's it's probably a combination of, of the of the Qmax, but um, also the fact that it was injected at such a high concentration. Okay. Um, but when you run when you run to file here, or you hit the refine button, it will automatically run the, the auto null. Um, so that's all you have to do. You just have to make sure settings is set correctly in the back, and then uh, hit that button. 
And then once that's done, you can go over here and select that GNOME file. Okay, choose. And then you can um, run, run uh, Damn or Damn If, you know, 17 runs, P1 symmetry, uh, fast mode, you know, four cores, three cores, and then hit start, and then it'll run Damn 17 times and then produce an averaged uh, model at the end of that. Um, but, um, Again, you, you, you just have to make sure that, that you've told Scatter where the binaries are and you're not using the latest assay. 